The Debt Collection Market and Selected Policy Issues. August 5, 2020. The Debt Collection Market and Selected Policy Issues. When a consumer defaults on a debt, a third-party debt collector often collects the debt obligation rather than the lender to whom the debt is originally owed. The debt collection market helps lenders recoup their losses when a consumer defaults, generally making consumer credit and other related markets more efficient. When lenders can effectively recoup their losses, they may be more willing to lend to consumers at lower initial loan costs, leading to more access to credit for consumers. The U.S. debt collection market is large, and the debt collection process impacts many American consumers. As of 2019, There are over 7,000 collection agencies in the United States, and the industry's annual revenue is about $12.7 billion. According to a Consumer Financial Protection Bureau survey, approximately one-third of consumers with a credit bureau file reported being contacted by at least one creditor or debt collector trying to collect on one or more debts in the previous year. Lenders make contracts with debt collectors to collect their debts, and consumers may not choose the debt collector with whom they engage. Therefore, consumers cannot take their business elsewhere if abuses occur. For this reason, consumer protection laws and regulations may be particularly consequential. According to the CFPB, debt collection is the consumer finance market with the second most complaints, accounting for 21% of the total complaints the agency received in 2019. Consumers' the most common debt collector complaints assert that a debt collector attempted to collect a debt the consumer did not believe was owed 45%, or a consumer received insufficient written notification about a debt 18%. The Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, FDCPA, 15 U.S.C. Section 1692-1692-P, is the primary federal statute regulating the consumer debt collection market. It generally applies only to debt collectors, not the original lender. The FDCPA prohibits debt collectors from engaging in certain types of conduct, such as misrepresentation or harassment, when seeking to collect certain personal, family, or household debts from consumers and grants consumers the right to dispute or stop some communications about an alleged debt. In addition, the FDCPA requires that a debt collector must send to a consumer a validation notice disclosing certain information about the debt. Recently, the CFPB has been actively engaged in rule-making intended to clarify and update provisions in the FDCPA. On May 21, 2019, the CFPB issued a notice of proposed rule-making for the debt collection market, which generally seeks to clarify how debt collectors should communicate with consumers. The proposed regulation would limit debt collector phone calls to seven times during a seven-day period and would prohibit debt collectors from making calls within a week after speaking by phone to a consumer. It would also specify that debt collectors can use newer technologies, such as email, voicemail, and text messages, to provide limited content messages to consumers. Debt collectors would be able to use these communication tools without limit, but consumers would have the right to request convenient times or places or restrict the communication medium, for example, opt out of text messages. In addition, the proposed rule would specify what information debt collectors should disclose to consumers, such as certain information about the debt, as well as consumers' rights in the debt collection process, for example, how to dispute a debt. Appropriate regulation of the debt collection market has been a focus of congressional attention in the 116th Congress. Ongoing concerns about debt collection include communication frequency, time-barred and obsolete debt, validation issues, medical debt and credit reporting, and federal, state, and local government debt. The House Financial Services Committee held a hearing on the debt collection market in September 2019. The House passed H.R. 5003, the Fair Debt Collection Practices for Service Members Act, on March 2, 2020. In addition, the committee marked up and ordered to be reported seven other bills relating to the debt collection market, H.R. 3948, H.R. 4403, H.R. 5001, H.R. 5013, H.R. 5021, H.R. 5287, and H.R. 5330. In response to the coronavirus disease 2019 COVID-19 pandemic, the House also passed the HEROES Act, H.R. 6800. 
Section 110,402 would, among other things, ban debt collectors from collecting on a debt, such as garnishment or seizing bank account assets, enforcing a security interest, such as repossession or foreclosure, or threatening to take an action on a debt during the COVID-19 pandemic and for 120 days afterwards. Section 110,402 also would ban debt collectors from charging additional fees and interest on debts that become past due during this period. Contents. Overview of debt collection market. 2. The market between creditors and debt collectors. 2. Consumer experiences. 5. The Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. 8. Supervision and enforcement. 9. Consumer Financial Protection Bureau rulemaking. 9. Debt disclosure. 9. Communication. 10. Policy issues. 10. Communication frequency. 11. Time barred and obsolete debt. 12. Validation issues. 13. Medical debt and credit reporting. 14. Federal, state, and local government debt exemptions. 15. Conclusion. 16. Figures. Figure 1. Debt collection major market segmentation by 2019 share of revenue. 3. Tables. Table 1. Types of debt collection complaints reported by consumers in 2019. 6. Table A1. Legislation passed by the House or marked up and ordered to be reported by the House Financial Services Committee during the 116th Congress, 2019-2020, primarily related to the debt collection market. 17. Appendixes. Appendix. 17. Contacts. Author information. 18. When a consumer defaults on a debt, a third-party debt collector or buyer, hereinafter referred to as debt collector, often collects the debt obligation, rather than the first-party creditor or lender to whom the debt is originally owed. The debt collection market helps lenders recoup their losses when a consumer defaults, facilitating the resolution of delinquencies and defaults and making consumer credit and other related markets more efficient. The U.S. debt collection market is large, and it impacts many consumers. As of 2019, There are over 7,000 collection agencies in the United States, and the industry's annual revenue is about $12.7 billion. 1. According to a Consumer Financial Protection Bureau survey, approximately one-third of consumers with a credit bureau file reported being contacted by at least one creditor or debt collector trying to collect on one or more debts in the previous year. 2. Lenders make contracts with debt collectors to collect their debts and consumers may not choose the debt collector with whom they engage. Therefore, consumers cannot take their business elsewhere if abuses occur. For this reason, consumer protection laws and regulations are particularly important. 3. According to the CFPB, debt collection is the consumer finance market with the second most complaints, accounting for 21% of the total complaints the agency received in 2019. 4. The Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, FDCPA, 15 U.S.C. Section 1692-1692-P, is the primary federal statute regulating the consumer debt collection market. It generally applies only to debt collectors, not the original lender. In recent years, the CFPB has been actively engaged in rule-making to clarify and update provisions in the FDCPA and in debt collection markets. Appropriate regulation of the debt collection market has been a focus of congressional attention in the 116th Congress. The House Financial Services Committee held a hearing on the debt collection market in September 2019.5 The House passed H.R. 5003, the Fair Debt Collection Practices for Service Members Act, on March 2, 2020. In addition, the committee marked up and ordered to be reported seven other bills relating to the debt collection market. H.R. 3948, H.R. 4403, H.R. 5001, H.R. 5013, H.R. 5021, H.R. 5287, and H.R. 5330. This report first provides an overview of the debt collection market, including consumer experiences during the debt collection process. Then, the report discusses the FDCPA including the CFPB's ongoing rulemaking. Lastly, the report discusses selected policy issues pertaining to debt collection, communication frequency, time barred and obsolete debt, validation issues, medical debt and credit reporting, 
and federal, state, and local government debt. Table A1 in the appendix summarizes the legislation on debt collection that passed the House or was marked up and ordered to be reported by the House Financial Services Committee during the 116th Congress. Overview of Debt Collection Market This section provides an overview of the debt collection market. First, it describes the market between creditors and debt collectors, and discusses debt collector operations in detail. Then, this section addresses consumer experiences in the market, including the CFPB's consumer complaints about the industry. The market between creditors and debt collectors. Creditors generally want to recoup their losses to the maximum extent possible after a consumer defaults on a loan or debt. When creditors can effectively recoup their losses, they may be more willing to lend to consumers at lower initial loan costs, leading to more access to credit for consumers. 6. Some creditors may choose to collect their debts themselves. However, some may choose to contract with a debt collector because they do not want to be associated with aggressive collection practices. 7. Because debt collectors might have a competitive advantage in collecting debt, or both. 8. Although creditors have the right to use the court system to recoup their losses by obtaining judgments against defaulting consumers, such as wage garnishment, these legal options may be more costly to creditors than the debt collection process. Many types of industries use the debt collection market. In 2019, debt from unpaid loans or other financial services accounted for close to 40% of debt collection revenue. 9. The other 60% of debt collection revenue included non-financial services debt, such as telecommunications, utility, medical, retail, and government debts. See Figure 1. 10. Figure 1. Debt collection major market segmentation by 2019 share of revenue. Debt collectors typically either contract with the original creditor to receive a share of any amount collected on behalf of the original lender or buy the debt obligation in full. 11. CFPB research suggests that buying the debt obligation in full has declined in the past decade. 12. And most debt collectors now operate by receiving a share of the amount collected on behalf of the original lender. 13. Creditors may choose among thousands of debt collector companies to contract with to collect or sell their consumer debts. 14. The CFPB estimates that about 95% of companies operating in this market are small businesses. 15. However, in the past few decades, the debt collection market has experienced consolidation due to new technologies, such as automated call center systems, which have made this industry more efficient and led to greater economies of scale. 16. Larger debt collection companies may be better positioned to handle higher volumes from larger companies and increased regulatory compliance burdens. 17. Debt collectors can call, send letters, and use other methods to contact consumers to collect an alleged debt. 18. In general, debt collectors expect to collect only a fraction of the face value of any particular debt, knowing that some consumers will never pay back their debts in full. Therefore, when a debt collector contacts a consumer, both parties can negotiate the amount and payment schedule of the debt. 19. If a consumer does not settle a debt, the debt owner often has several options, such as seizing the collateral for secured loans, for example, car, home, 20, or garnishing a consumer's wages after obtaining a court order. According to CFPB research, the cost of filing a claim plays a large role in litigation decisions and varies significantly across jurisdictions based on differences in factors such as filing fees and what types of collections claims can be brought in small claims court. 21. More than half of filed suits lead to default judgments in favor of the debt owner, often because consumers fail to appear in court. 22. According to a CFPB consumer survey, about 15% of those contacted about a debt were sued in the past year. 23. Of those sued, a fraction, about a quarter, of consumers reported attending the court hearing. 24. Debt collection and credit reporting. Many financial institutions furnish information about their customers' payment histories to credit bureaus. 25. Credit bureaus or credit reporting agencies collect and subsequently provide consumer information to firms, which use this information to screen for consumer risks. For example, 
Lenders rely on credit reports and scores to determine the likelihood that prospective borrowers will repay their loans before entering into a financial relationship with those consumers. Debt collectors are not required, but they may choose to furnish information about debts to credit bureaus. For financial services debts, lenders may have already reported to the credit bureaus that a consumer defaulted on the debt before debt collection begins. For non-financial debts, creditors are often less likely to report this information. According to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, CFPB, debt collectors frequently choose not to furnish information to credit bureaus due to costs and potential legal liability, but most debt collectors furnish information occasionally. 26. Generally, debt buyers who buy debt obligations in full are more likely to report debts to credit bureaus. 27. Debts can generally be reported in a consumer's credit record for seven years. A debt is considered obsolete when it can no longer be included in a consumer's credit report. Over one-fourth of consumers have a debt collection on their credit report. 28. Past due medical bills, credit cards, and student loans were the most common types of debts on credit records. 29. According to the CFPB, those contacted about credit card and student loan debts differed more across demographic characteristics and credit scores than those contacted about medical debt. 30. Some debt collectors engage in passive collections, reporting a debt to a credit reporting agency and waiting for the consumer to discover and pay back the debt, rather than spending resources actively collecting the debt from consumers. The practice of passive collections is controversial, and the CFPB suggests that it may not affect many consumers. 31. Debt collections are disputed with credit bureaus at a greater rate than other types of credit report information. 32. This could be for many reasons. For example, debt collection information is more likely to negatively affect a consumer's credit record. In addition, this information may tend to be less accurate than other credit report information. According to a CFPB survey, more than half of consumers who had been contacted about a debt in collection reported an error relating to at least one such debt, 33. And about a quarter disputed the debt with the debt collector, 34. Although consumers' demographics were not correlated with citing an issue with an alleged debt, older, wealthier, and higher credit quality consumers were more likely to report disputing the debt. 35. Consumer experiences. Many consumers in the United States experience the debt collection process. 36. According to a 2014-2015 CFPB survey, about one-third of consumers with a credit bureau file reported being contacted in the last year by at least one creditor or collector trying to collect on one or more debts. 37. Consumers with lower incomes and non-prime credit scores were more likely to report experiences with debt collection than consumers with higher incomes and prime credit scores. 38. In addition, over 40% of consumers reported telling a collector to stop contacting them, and of those consumers, about a quarter reported that the contact stopped after their request. 39. According to the CFPB, Consumer complaints about debt collection accounted for 21% of the total complaints it received in 2019. 40. The most common such complaints asserted that a debt collector attempted to collect a debt the consumer did not believe was owed, 45%, or a consumer received insufficient written notification about a debt, 18%, see Table 1. 41. Table 1. Types of debt collection complaints reported by consumers in 2019. Types of complaints. Percent of debt collection complaints. Attempts to collect debt not owed. 45%. Complaints about written notification about the debt. 18%. Negative or legal actions or threats to take such actions. 12%. Complaints about communication tactics. 12%. False statements or representations. 11%. Threats to contact someone or share information improperly. 3%. Consumers who cannot pay their debts may turn to the federal bankruptcy process, which is generally governed by the bankruptcy code. 42. In general, the bankruptcy process allows a consumer to enter a court-administered proceeding to discharge certain debts and obtain a fresh start. However, consumers may face negative repercussions by choosing bankruptcy, for example, a lower credit score and reduced access to credit for several years afterward. 
In 2005, Congress passed the Bankruptcy Abuse Prevention and Consumer Protection Act, BAPCPA, PL 109-8, in response to what some perceived as a high number of consumer bankruptcy filings and concerns about some consumers abusing the system. BAPCPA made numerous amendments to the bankruptcy code. One change was to impose a means test to determine when consumers have the financial ability to pay their debts in installments over several years, rather than receiving more immediate relief from their debts. 43. In addition to the federal bankruptcy process, many states limit the length of time consumers can be sued on a debt, called time-barred debt. 44. Different states have different time-barred debt rules, but generally, most fall between three and six years. 45. Therefore, some consumers may have their debts age past the statute of limitations, even if they do not go through the bankruptcy process. 46. This result is sometimes referred to as informal bankruptcy. Even though consumers are no longer able to be sued on time-barred debts, debt collectors in most states can continue to collect on these debts. In addition, in many states, debts can be revived if certain conditions are met. For example, in some states, if a consumer makes a partial payment on a debt or acknowledges it in writing, a debt collector can sue on the debt after the statute of limitations has expired. Debt Relief Companies and Credit Counseling Agencies Debt relief companies and credit counseling agencies provide services to help consumers manage unsecured debt. 47. These organizations can be non-profit or for-profit companies. Two common types of debt relief services are debt consolidation, consolidating debts into one larger consumer loan, and debt management plans working with creditors to gain concessions, such as waiving fees and lowering interest rates, to make it easier for consumers to pay back creditors. Related services, such as financial education, are often offered by these types of organizations. Debt settlements are agreements between the creditor and consumer to resolve the debt for less than the full balance owed. These settlements are sometimes arranged directly between creditors and consumers and are sometimes managed by debt relief companies. Consumer Financial Protection Bureau data suggest a growth in debt settlements in recent years. 48. A consumer protection concern in this market is whether consumers understand their options and the services they are paying for. In recent years, the federal government has implemented new regulations on these organizations. In 2006, Congress created standards for nonprofit credit counseling agencies, such as reasonable fees, bans on the provision of loans, and limits on the ability to financially gain from services provided to consumers. 49. In 2010, the Federal Trade Commission issued a final rule that bans for profit debt relief companies from charging a fee before providing their services to consumers. 50. It also requires disclosures and prohibits misrepresentations when telemarketing debt relief services to consumers. Given the industry's growth in recent years, debate continues around its appropriate regulation. 51. The Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. 52. Robust debt collection markets may benefit consumers by expanding access to credit, but they could also harm consumers. Creditors who rely on relationships with consumers for future business may care more about maintaining their reputations when collecting on a debt than debt collectors who contract with creditors rather than consumers. Consumers do not have the ability to choose the debt collector with whom they engage and are unable to take their business elsewhere if abuses occur. In this way, the debt collection market does not provide an economic incentive to provide good service to consumers, as in other consumer markets. For this reason, consumer protection laws and regulations may be particularly consequential. The FDCPA is the primary federal statute regulating the consumer debt collection market. 53. Congress passed the FDCPA in 1977 to eliminate abusive debt collection practices by debt collectors. 54. The law generally applies only to debt collectors, not the original creditors. 55. It prohibits debt collectors from engaging in certain types of conduct when seeking to collect certain debts from consumers, such as engaging in harassment or abuse. 56. Or making false or misleading representations. 57. The FDCPA limits when and how a debt collector communicates with a consumer, such as limits on communications at unusual time, s or place, s. 58. 
and grants consumers the right to dispute 59 or stop certain communications about an alleged debt. 60. Moreover, the FDCPA requires that a debt collector must send a consumer a validation notice, which is to disclose certain information about the debt to the consumer, within five days of the initial communication. 61. In 2010, the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act, Dodd-Frank Act, PL 111-203, granted the CFPB authority over the FDCPA and became the first federal agency to be able to write regulations to implement the FDCPA. 62. It also grants the CFPB authority over those who collect debt related to a consumer financial product service, as defined in the Dodd-Frank Act. The rest of this section discusses the CFPB's supervision and enforcement of the FDCPA. This section also discusses the CFPB's active proposed rulemaking related to the debt collection market, including its intention to clarify and update provisions in the FDCPA. Supervision and Enforcement The federal government supervises and enforces the debt collection market for compliance with relevant laws, such as the FDCPA. The CFPB has supervisory authority, or the authority to conduct examinations, over non-bank firms with more than $10 million in annual receipts from consumer debt collection activities. Both the Federal Trade Commission, FTC, and the CFPB can enforce FDCPA provisions. 63. The FDCPA also establishes a private right of action for consumers to sue on their own behalf. 64. Recently, the debt collection market has been an active area for the CFPB and the FTC. The CFPB is required to report annually on the administration of its functions relating to the FDCPA. In fiscal year 2019, the CFPB found three patterns in its supervisory activities. 1. The false representation of the amount and legal status of debts. 2. A failure to disclose what communications are coming from a debt collector and 3. A failure to send mandatory debt validation notices to consumers before collecting on a debt. 65. In fiscal year 2019, the CFPB and the FTC also announced, filed, or resolved more than 30 debt collection enforcement actions. 66. In addition, the CFPB and the FTC conducted education and outreach to the public about consumer rights and responsibilities in the debt collection market under relevant laws. 67. Consumer Financial Protection Bureau Rulemaking. On May 21, 2019, the CFPB sued a notice of proposed rulemaking intended to regulate the debt collection market. 68. The CFPB's proposed regulation, among other things, seeks to clarify what information debt collectors should be required to disclose to consumers and how they should be required to communicate with consumers. The following sections describe selected provisions of the CFPB's proposal. Debt Disclosure The CFPB's proposed regulation would specify information a debt collector must include in the validation notice it sends to a consumer, including certain information about the debt that may help the consumer identify the debt. It also would require disclosure about a consumer's rights in the debt collection process, such as how to dispute a debt. The proposed regulation also would establish certain procedures by which a debt collector may obtain a safe harbor from liability. For example, the CFPB, through consumer testing, has developed a model validation notice form, which debt collectors may use to ensure they are complying with the law. 69. In addition, the proposal would bar debt collectors from furnishing information about a debt to a credit bureau before sending the consumer a validation notice about the debt. 70. On March 3, 2020, the CFPB issued a supplemental proposal, 71, which would require a debt collector to disclose to a consumer whether a debt is time-barred. The supplemental proposal also would require the debt collector to disclose whether the debt could be revived by the consumer and how revival could occur. Like the model validation notice, the CFPB developed time-barred debt and revival disclosures using quantitative and qualitative disclosure testing, which debt collectors can use to ensure they are complying with the law. 72. Communication. The proposal would specify appropriate communication tactics for debt collectors. It would set standards on contact frequency, limiting debt collector phone calls to seven times in a seven-day period. 
It would also prohibit debt collectors from making calls within a week after speaking by phone to a consumer. The proposed regulation would clarify that debt collectors can use newer technologies, such as email, voicemail, and text messages, to provide limited content messages to consumers. Debt collectors would be able to use these communication tools without limit, but consumers would have the right to request convenient times or places or restrict the communication medium, e.g., opt out of text messages. Policy issues. Appropriate regulation of the debt collection market has been a focus of congressional attention in the 116th Congress. Research suggests that policymakers face a trade-off in the debt collection market between consumer protection benefits and the cost of reduced credit availability for consumers. Some economic research suggests that stricter debt collection regulations may lead to lower recovery rates on past debts, causing a reduction in credit or higher cost of credit for some consumers. However, the magnitude of this effect is debated. 73. This section highlights five significant policy issues in the debt collection market. 1. Communication frequency. 2. Time-barred and obsolete debt. 3. Validation issues. 4. Medical debt and credit reporting. And 5. Federal, state, and local government debt. Table A1 in the appendix summarizes the bills passed by the House or marked up by the House Financial Services Committee in the 116th Congress. The COVID-19 pandemic and debt collection. The economic impact of the coronavirus disease 2019 COVID-19 pandemic has caused many Americans to lose income and face financial hardship. 74. The situation has caused some consumers to have trouble paying their debts. 75. On May 15, 2020, the House passed the Health and Economic Recovery Omnibus Emergency Solutions Act, HEROES Act, H.R. 6800. 76. Among other provisions, Section 110402 would ban debt collectors from collecting on a debt, such as garnishment or seizing bank account assets, enforcing a security interest, such as repossession or foreclosure, or threatening to take an action on a debt during the COVID-19 pandemic and for 120 days afterwards. Section 110402 also would ban debt collectors from charging additional fees and interest on debts that become past due during this period. Section 110,403 defines appropriate repayment periods for different types of past due debts after the Section 110,402 period ends. Private sector debt collectors would be able to use a credit facility established in Section 110,404 if they were to automatically grant loan forbearance to consumers who are experiencing financial hardship and request loan forbearance within the COVID-19 pandemic period and up to 120 days afterwards. Sections 110,402 and 110,403 of the HEROES Act would provide debt relief for consumers facing financial hardship during the COVID-19 pandemic. Some observe that these provisions could also encourage some consumers not to pay their debts, even if they have not been financially impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. 77. Communication Frequency the communication frequency standards proposed in the CFPB's rule continue to be a contentious issue. As mentioned in the communication section, the CFPB's proposed regulation would limit debt collector phone calls to seven times in a seven-day period and would prohibit debt collectors from making calls within a week after speaking by phone to a consumer. In addition, debt collectors could use technologies such as email or text message without limit, unless consumers were to opt out. The proposal would set standards on contact frequency, which could reduce lawsuits relating to legal uncertainty, benefiting both debt collectors and consumers. 78. Some observers disagree about whether the CFPB's proposed communication frequency standards would be at the right levels. Some industry representatives argue that call frequency limits may make it more difficult to reach and follow up with consumers, increasing the cost and length of time to resolve debts. 79. Some consumer groups argue that call frequency limits should be lowered. 80. A CFPB survey found that most consumers considered four or more calls a week to be too much contact, and some take this as evidence that the phone call limit should be lower. 81. In addition, although some commentators believe that allowing debt collectors to send unlimited emails and text messages could lead to consumer abuse, 
Others argue that these new technologies could be convenient for consumers and reduce debt collection costs. The CFPB's survey suggested that most consumers preferred email over other types of communication methods. 82. Some argue that because texts or emails may cost money for consumers to receive, these should be opt-in communications. 83. For example, HR 5021, see Table A1, would prohibit a debt collector from contacting a consumer by email or text message without a consumer's opt-in consent for those communication methods, in contrast with the CFPB's proposal. Time-barred and obsolete debt. The proposed treatment of time-barred and obsolete debt in the CFPB's rule is a contentious issue. Consumers are not always aware of statute of limitation rules and might not know that a debt is no longer legally owed. This ignorance can cause consumer harm in a few different ways. First, consumers may pay debts that they would choose not to pay or not prioritize paying if they knew they could no longer be sued on the debt. In addition, as mentioned in the Consumer Experiences section, time-barred debts can sometimes be revived if a borrower makes a payment or acknowledges the debt in writing. In these cases, consumers can again be sued for this debt, and the statute of limitations is restarted. A debt is considered obsolete when it can no longer be included in a consumer's credit report, generally after seven years. Consumers may not be aware of when debts can no longer be included on credit reports. In its rulemaking, the CFPB has proposed mandating time-barred debt and revival disclosures for consumers but not for obsolete debts. The time-barred and revival disclosures developed by the CFPB have led to more consumer comprehension of these concepts. 84. However, the CFPB's qualitative testing suggested some consumers were confused about time-barred debt, obsolete debt, and revival, even with disclosures provided. 85. In addition, the CFPB found that although a majority of respondents answered comprehension questions correctly when viewing these disclosures, the comprehension gains were more pronounced for those with higher education and income levels. 86. For these reasons, some argue that the CFPB should ban the collection of time-barred debts. 87. Validation issues. Debt validation is another significant policy issue in this market, where debt collectors may contact the wrong consumer or collect for the wrong amount. If a consumer receives a debt collection validation notice from a debt collector, no debt collector database or other resource currently exists to help the consumer verify that the debt collector owns the debt or that the information about the debt is accurate. The consumer would need to recognize the debt in order to believe that they owe it. Some of these verification issues may exist because debt collectors are not required to obtain a debt's full files from the original lender. 88. Sometimes, the original lender conveys only basic information to the debt collector, unless a consumer disputes the debt, due to expense and technical complications between systems. 89. For example, creditors sometimes do not provide copies of underlying account documentation to debt collectors, such as account statements or agreements. 90. In these cases, debt collectors would obtain these documents from creditors only when needed, e.g., if a consumer files an FDCPA dispute. 91. This practice reduces costs for debt collectors, but it may lead to debt transfer information issues between creditors and debt collectors. According to the CFPB, there are often substantial deficiencies in the quality and quantity of information collectors receive at placement or sale of the debt that frequently result in collectors contacting the wrong consumer, for the wrong amount, or for debts that the collector is not entitled to collect. 92. CFPB research suggests that many debt collectors might undergo little review of creditor data to check for potential inaccuracies or unreliability. 93. In addition, lenders often do not make representations as to the accuracy of the transferred information that the debt collector receives. 94. Moreover, debt collectors may not receive much information about whether a consumer has disputed the same debt in the past and as a debt gets older and possibly resold, information may decay. Some debt collectors also may file litigation against a consumer without the underlying documentation 95. As creditors often obtain default judgments because many consumers do not attend their court hearings. 96. Inaccurate information about debts can harm consumers. For example, a consumer might pay debts they are not obligated to pay. 
In addition, validation issues can lead to more disputes and complaints, requiring consumers and debt collectors to spend time disputing debts or invalid lawsuits. Part of the reason that many consumers report inaccuracies with their debts in collections may be due to limited information on debt validation notices. Currently, most validation notices do not include some elements, such as the original creditor or original amount owed. The information in the notice might be insufficient for some consumers to recognize their debts. 97. To address some of these concerns, the CFPB proposed rule would clarify additional information debt collectors should disclose to consumers in the validation notice. However, some argue that validation errors will not be reduced without mandating that debt collectors improve the quality and transparency of their information and record keeping prior to taking action to collect the debt. Others argue that this type of regulation could be prohibitively expensive and overly burdensome for debt collectors. 98. The CFPB has announced enforcement actions regarding inaccurate or unverifiable information used during the debt collection process. 99. Although the CFPB has considered debt information validation proposals, the CFPB did not include any requirements relating to debt information transfer or validation in its proposed rule. 100. Medical debt and credit reporting. Medical debt collection raises specific policy issues relating to inconsistent billing and reporting practices. According to a 2014 CFPB study, Consumers are unlikely to know how much various medical services cost in advance, particularly those associated with accidents and emergencies. 101. People often have difficulty understanding co-pays and health insurance deductibles, and medical debts are often transferred to debt collectors after different periods of time, depending on the medical provider. Therefore, medical debts can appear on people's credit reports inconsistently. To address inconsistency concerns, the Internal Revenue Service IRS, announced on December 31, 2014, a final rule requiring the separation of billing and collection policies of nonprofit hospitals. 102. Under the rule, hospitals that have or are pursuing tax exempt status are required to make reasonable efforts to determine whether their patients are eligible for financial assistance before engaging in extraordinary collection actions, which may include turning a debt over to a collection agency or garnishing wages. In short, tax-exempt hospitals must allow patients 120 days from the date of the first billing statement to pay the obligation before initiating collection procedures. 103. The IRS rule impacts only nonprofit hospitals, but on September 15, 2017, the three major credit reporting agencies, Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion 104, established a 180-day, six-month, waiting period after the date of first delinquency before posting a medical collection of any type on a consumer credit report. 105. Concerns about the impact of medical debts on credit reports continue. Some observers may believe it is unfair for medical debts to appear on credit reports because these debts are generally incurred for medically necessary reasons and are less likely to indicate whether someone is financially responsible. For example, the CFPB found that medical debts may be less reliable predictors of creditworthiness or credit performance than other types of debts. 106. HR 5330 would prohibit furnishing medical debt to consumer reporting agencies for a year 107. And would prohibit medical debt related to medically necessary procedures from inclusion in consumer credit reports. See Table A1. 108 federal, state, and local government debt exemptions. Currently, government fines and fees are often exempt from the FDCPA. 109. Therefore, if a government fine or fee, such as a municipal utility bill, traffic ticket, or court debt, creates a debt that is transferred to a debt collector, that collector is not always required to comply with the FDCPA. Recently, as more government debts have been outsourced to debt collectors, reports of aggressive debt collection practices for these types of debt have grown. 110. Some federal government programs, such as the Federal Student Loan Program, by statute have flexible repayment terms, for example, income-driven repayment plans 111. However, when these types of debts go into default and are transferred to a debt collector, the consumer loses some of these consumer protections. 
H.R. 3948 would make state and local debts collected by debt collectors subject to the FDCPA, and H.R. 4403 would make many federal debts collected by debt collectors subject to the FDCPA and other rules. H.R. 5287 would prohibit debt collectors from collecting or garnishing wages for federal student loan debts that would not require payment under an income-driven repayment plan and would subject these debt collectors to the FDCPA, see Table A1. Conclusion. The debt collection market continues to be an important part of ensuring that consumers have access to a robust consumer credit market. However, the potential for consumer harm may make consumer protection laws and regulations particularly important. The regulation of the debt collection market may continue to be an active policy issue because it impacts many consumers going through the debt collection process and the efficiency of consumer credit markets in the United States. As the CFPB finalizes and implements its debt collection rulemaking, stakeholders may be able to see how new regulations could impact the market. For these reasons, the debt collection market may continue to be the subject of congressional interest and legislative proposals. Appendix. Table A1. Legislation passed by the House or marked up and ordered to be reported by the House Financial Services Committee during the 116th Congress, 2019-2020, primarily related to the debt collection market. Bill Number. Bill Title. Summary of Bill. H.R. 3948. Debt Collection Practices Harmonization Act. Makes state and local debts, such as municipal utility bills, traffic tickets, and court debts, collected by a debt collector subject to the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, FDCPA, among other things. H.R. 4403. Stop Debt Collection Abuse Act. Makes certain federal agency debts, such as a fine, fee, penalty, or other money owed to a federal government agency that is not less than 180 days past due, collected by a debt collector subject to the FDCPA, among other things. H.R. 5001. Non-Judicial Foreclosure Debt Collection Clarification Act. Makes non-judicial foreclosure proceedings covered under the FDCPA. H.R. 5003. Fair Debt Collection Practices for Service Members Act. Prohibits a debt collector from threatening the member's rank or security clearance, or to have the member prosecuted under the Uniform Code of Military Justice, among other things. H.R. 5013. Small Business Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. Expands FDCPA protections to cover debts owed by small businesses. H.R. 5021. Ending Debt Collection Harassment Act. Prohibits a debt collector from contacting a consumer by email, text message, or other electronic means without a consumer's opt-in consent to be contacted electronically, among other things. H.R. 5287. Fair Student Loan Debt Collection Practices Act. Prohibits debt collectors from collecting or garnishing wages for federal student loan debts that would not require payment under an income-driven repayment plan and subjects these debt collectors to the FDCPA among other things. H.R. 5330. Consumer Protections for Medical Debt Collections Act. Prohibits medical debt related to medically necessary procedures from inclusion in consumer credit reports, among other things. Notes. H.R. 5003 passed the House on March 2, 2020. All other bills were marked up and ordered to be reported by the House Financial Services Committee during the 116th Congress. Author Information Cheryl R. Cooper Analyst in Financial Economics